good morning or good evening, depending upon where you are, and welcome. My name is Steve Cantrell, and I am the chair of the Department of Mathematics here at the University of Miami and the director of the Institute of the Mathematical Sciences of the Americas, IMSA, here at UM. IMSA is generously supported by a grant from the Simons Foundation and is an emblematic project in the university's roadmap to its second century. We are very grateful for this support. The mission of IMSA is threefold. One, to foster and facilitate research in mathematics and its applications across the Americas. Two, to disseminate advances from this research broadly and interactively to the global mathematical and scientific communities. And three, to build national and international capacity in the mathematical science workforce by providing targeted educational opportunities at key points in the human intellectual development from middle school through postdoctoral training. Among the main areas of applications of mathematics of interest at UM, IMSA, and across the Americas are biology and medicine. COVID-19 has highlighted the importance and relevance of mathematics to the world in a way that perhaps nothing like it has done before. Indeed, bending the curve is arguably the catchphrase of the year. Our hope for today is to shed some light on the connections among mathematical modeling, predictions of health outcomes, and social consequences across the Americas. I am enormously grateful that two figures at the absolute top of the games worldwide, one a member of the National Academy of Medicine, President Frank, and the other, Professor Levin, the National Academy of Science, intellectual rock stars have agreed to participate in our dialogue today. I am also overwhelmed by the response from all of you attending this webinar. Beyond phenomenal interest across the university and from our broader university family of friends and supporters, we are delighted to welcome guests from at least eight countries. Indeed, there are 600 total registrants with an enormous presence from our friends and neighbors in Mexico. Following brief presentation by President Frank and Professor Levin, we will have a question and answer session. Many of you have submitted questions in advance and you may submit questions during the Q&A sessions. We will take as many as time permits. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first co-moderator for today's event, Dr. Ernesto Lupercio of the Center for Research and Advanced Studies of the National Polytechnic Institute in Mexico, or CINVASTAV, its acronym in Spanish. Professor Lupercio is internationally known for his contributions to algebraic topology, geometry, and mathematical physics. He earned his PhD in 1997 from Stanford under the supervision of Ralph Cohen. He was awarded the International Center for Theoretical Physics Ramanujan Prize and the Third World Academy of Science Rolak Young Scholar Prize in 2009 and was one of the most important proponents of mathematical collaboration across the, the Americas that indeed led to the establishment of IMSA. He will introduce President Frank in both English and Spanish. Ernesto, thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. It is a great honor to introduce Professor Frank um, here at IMSA for the first time. Uh, so, um, Professor Julio Frank Mora was born in Mexico City on December the 20th of 1953. In 1979, he graduated as a surgeon from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. At the University of Michigan, he earned three advanced degrees, Master of Public Health, 1981, Master of Sociology in 1982, and a joint doctorate in healthcare organization and sociology in 1983. He was the founder director of the National Institute of Public Health of the SSA based in Cuernavaca, Morelos, which has spread to the, uh, this institute has been the engine that has given impetus to the new public health in Mexico, which has spread to the three levels of government in the 32 states and to the major institutions of the health sector 
SSA, IMSS, ISTE, Pemex, Armed Forces, and others in Mexico. Change the history of public health in the country. His written output includes 23 books, 15 monographs, 77 book chapters, 161 articles in academic journals, and 127 articles in cultural magazines and newspapers. His academic publications have been cited around 13,000 times. His books also include four novels for children and young people, which explain the functioning of the human body. Consider one of the leading experts on the subject of the relationship between globalization and health. His research has focused largely on health systems. He has studied demographic and epidemiological transitions, analyzing their implications for public policies regarding changes in the dominant patterns of health and disease. Between 1995 and 1998, he was executive vice president of the Mexican Health Foundation, where he produced a critical analysis of the health system, which is contained in his book, Economy and Health, that offers comprehensive options for reform. Between 1988 and 2000, he was executive director in charge of scientific evidence and policy information at the World Health Organization, based in Geneva, Switzerland, a position for which he guided the design of public policies and the strengthening of national capacities to improve the performance of health systems globally. He was secretary of health of Mexico from 2000 to 2006, a period during which the foundations of universal coverage in the area of social protection in healthcare laid with the creation of the Seguro Popular, probably one of his uh, largest contributions to, to the well being of, um, of the health of the country, thus expanding access to quality services and financial safeguards for more than 55 million people until then excluded from social security. This was a truly major thing in the, in the history of uh, public health in Mexico. Between 2007 and 2008, he served as a senior fellow in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Global Health Program, where he offered advice on strategies and programs. In the same period, he was also executive president of the Carso Institute of Health, a philanthropic organization dedicated to stimulating innovation in the health systems of Latin America. Since August 2015, he is the president of the University of Miami, where he has also been conferred an academic appointment as a full professor of public health sciences at the School of Medicine. Before occupying his current position, he served for nearly seven years as dean of the Harvard University School of Public Health, a joint appointment with the same university's chemist Kennedy School of Government. Among other recognitions, he has received honorary degrees from the University of Alberta in Canada, from the University of Geneva in Switzerland, and from York University in Toronto, Canada. In September 2008, he received the Clinton Global Citizen Award for changing the way service providers and decision makers around the world think about health. He was recently awarded the Edward A. Boucher Medal for Understanding Leadership, Outstanding Leadership and Diversity in higher education by Yale University. Julio Frank Mora uh, was named a member of El Colegio Nacional more recently on May of 2017. Uh, now I'll repeat this introduction for our Spanish speakers. Julio Frank Mora nació in La Ciudad de México el 20 de diciembre de 1953. En 1979, se graduó como médico cirujano por la UNAM. En la Universidad de Michigan obtuvo tres grados avanzados, maestría en salud pública en el 81, maestría en sociología en el 82 y doctorado conjunto en organización de la atención médica y en sociología en 83. Fue director fundador del Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública de la Secretaría de Salud con sede en Cuernavaca, Morelos. Este instituto ha sido el motor que ha dado impulso a la Escuela de la Nueva Salud Pública de México que se ha extendido a los tres niveles de gobierno en las 32 entidades federativas y a las grandes instituciones del sector salud, eh, la ISSA, el INSS, el ISTE, Pemex, las Fuerzas Armadas y otras. 
Su producción escrita incluye 23 libros, 15 monografías, 77 capítulos de libros, 161 artículos en revistas académicas y 127 artículos en revistas culturales y periódicos. Sus publicaciones académicas han sido citadas alrededor de 13.000 veces. En sus libros también se cu eh, cuentan cuatro novelas para niños y jóvenes, las cuales explican el funcionamiento del cuerpo humano. Considerado uno de los principales expertos en el tema de la relación entre la globalización y la salud, sus investigaciones se han centrado mayormente en los sistemas de salud. Ha estudiado las transiciones demográficas y epidemiológicas, analizando sus implicaciones para las políticas públicas respecto a los cambios en los patrones dominantes de salud y enfermedad. Entre el 95 y el 98 fue presidente ejecutivo de la Fundación Mexicana para la Salud, donde produjo un análisis crítico del sistema de salud, el cual se encuentra contenido en su libro, Economía y Salud, que ofrece opciones integrales de reforma. Entre el 88 y el 2000 fue director ejecutivo encargado de pruebas científicas e información para las políticas en la Organización Mundial de la Salud, con sede en Ginebra, Suiza. Puesto desde el cual orientó el diseño de las políticas públicas y el fortalecimiento de las capacidades nacionales para mejorar el desempeño de los sistemas de salud a nivel global. Fue secretario de Salud de México de 2000 a 2006, periodo durante el cual se sentaron las bases de la cobertura universal en materia de protección social en salud con la creación del Seguro Popular, un logro monumental, ampliando así el acceso a servicios de calidad y salvaguardia financiera por para más de 55 millones de personas, hasta entonces excluidas de la seguridad social. Es difícil estresar eh, la, eh, lo importante que fue este evento en la historia de la salud pública en México. Entre 2007 y 2008, fungió como asociado principal en el programa de salud global de la Fundación Bill y Melinda Gates, donde ofreció asesoría sobre estrategias y programas. En el mismo periodo, también fue presidente ejecutivo del Instituto Carso de la Salud, organización filantrópica dedicada a estimular la innovación en los sistemas de salud de América Latina. Desde agosto de 2015, es el eh, presidente de la Universidad de Miami, donde también se le ha conferido un nombramiento académico como profesor titular de Ciencias de la Salud Pública en la Facultad de Medicina. Además de ocupar su posición actual, antes de ocupar su posición actual, fungió por casi siete años como decano de la Facultad de, de Salud Pública de la Universidad de Harvard, un nombramiento conjunto con la Escuela Kennedy de Gobierno en la misma universidad. Entre otros reconocimientos, ha recibido doctorados honoris causa por la Universidad de Alberta en Canadá, la Universidad de Ginebra en Suiza y por la Universidad de York en Toronto, Canadá. En septiembre de 2008, recibió el premio Clinton al ciudadano global por cambiar la manera en que los prestadores de servicios y los tomadores de decisiones de todo el mundo piensan sobre la salud. Recientemente fue merecedor de la medalla Edward Boucher por liderazgo destacado y diversidad en educación superior que otorga la Universidad de Yale. Julio Fren Mora ingresó al Colegio Nacional más recientemente en mayo de 2017. Es un honor eh, considerable para IMSA eh, tenerte con nosotros, Julio. Muchas gracias. Buenos días, buenas tardes, good morning, good afternoon. Gracias, thank you to Ernesto Lupercio for this very kind and exhaustive introduction. I appreciate it very much, a bilingual introduction. I want to thank uh, Stephen Cantrell for uh, convening us today and congratulate him on the development of the uh, Institute of the Mathematical Sciences of the America, SIMSA. Uh, it's, it, it, as he said, this is a key, a key part of our, uh, what we call our hemispheric strategy, trying to leverage the geographic position of the University of Miami and, and really become a force for good across the Americas and indeed across, across the globe. And this is, of course, especially appropriate time to do so since we are in the midst of a, of a global crisis of unprecedented magnitude. Um, and I, I will make very brief intro, introductory remarks on, on some of the aspects. This happens to be my, my disciplinary field, uh, global public health, where I have worked um, most of my life. I, this is the, actually the fourth pandemic I've been directly involved, uh, involved with. Um, uh, but, but this is truly unique in the depth and breadth of consequences. 
and, uh, and so I think it's it's a great topic as, as Steve uh, <coughs> mentioned at the beginning it has also been an opportunity for in, 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 in a period when we see populist governments questioning the authority of experts it has been an opportunity to see how deeply most people are thirsting for um, sound clear explanations and how much public visibility mathematical modeling has acquired because let's face it the, the defining attribute of any pandemic is uncertainty by definition this is the first time human beings are encountering a novel pathogen so although there's some knowledge that we have acquired from previous pandemics each mutation each novel pathogen is unique and therefore we really don't know what's going to happen we learn as we go but in the face of uncertainty, everyone, both decision makers and, and, and the public at large, are seeking some level of, if not certainty, at least some ability to foresee what's happening. And that's where modeling uh, has, has played this huge role. And we see that in the briefings from you know, the top uh, political figures around the world. It's, 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 I think, been probably one of the largest exercises in, in popularizing the um, uh, the social value of investing in uh, in the creation of knowledge and, and abstract concepts suddenly become very concrete and I would even say essential for people's um, uh, sense of well-being as they're navigating this period of of great uncertainty. Now, uh, you know, this particular uh, strain of the coronavirus has um, two elements or two characteristics that make it on, on that you know, common layer of uncertainty. This has two particular characteristics that make it uh, especially challenging. The first one uh, is that it is highly, highly contagious. And the second one, and probably more important, is the fact that the virus can be spread by people who are asymptomatic or who have very mild symptoms. So uh, contrary to other pandemics were, uh, or other uh, international uh, public health emergencies of, of, of global concern, this coronavirus can be spread by people who look and feel fine. And that has uh, placed a huge strain on the traditional public health response. The traditional public health response, uh, which, what we call a containment strategy, consists of being able to detect each individual case and then trace the contacts and isolate or quarantine only those people. But in the case of this pandemic, those characteristics were coupled by a huge delay in implementing testing in many countries of the world. And this is probably, by the way, a key factor, if not the key factor, that separates countries that have dealt better than others. But in many, many countries, including many countries in Latin America, which will be the focus of what I say, although some of these uh, comments apply elsewhere, you can see that very basic distinction. And countries that delayed initial uh, testing to identify and trace, uh, and if we have positive cases and trace contacts, were quickly overwhelmed given how rapidly, uh, how contagious this particular virus is. And, and by the time they started responding, they, we had, uh, the, the virus was entrenched through so-called community transmission. And the traditional containment strategies were no longer possible. We had to move into mitigation strategies, which required that everyone, whether they're sick or healthy, have to uh, observe what's called social distancing. I personally prefer the term physical distancing because the idea is not to become socially isolated. That in itself has other health consequences. And thankfully today we have technology like the one we're using today um, and, and uh, to, to stay connected. But this physical distancing has in turn triggered a huge, huge economic crisis that started shortly after the, the pandemic and the introduction of generalized lockdown measures and will probably outlive the pandemic uh, because, um, you know, I think bio, biomedical sciences are more advanced than economic sciences and we're likely to find solutions, but we don't have vaccines against recessions and therefore uh, those financial consequences will be felt 
um, for a much longer period of time than the, than the pandemic that triggered that recession it, itself. Now, um, what I, my last comment is, as I observe the global response, there's clearly two groups of countries. Uh, one group responded quickly, uh, started testing, and were able to deal with the pandemic quickly. Many of those are the you know, now iconic cases of South Korea or, or New Zealand or Australia. In uh, Latin America, we saw countries like Chile, Colombia, uh, uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, Costa Rica, all of them responding very quickly. And they're now pretty much, uh, you know, have contained most of the uh, most of the cases and are reopening. Costa Rica is opening uh, already, and Colombia is going to do so on, on Monday. Uh, Chile has had an uptick in in in, in deaths, uh, which is interesting. However, you have another uh, group of countries, and the characteristic there was a tendency to first minimize and even trivialize the pandemic, and therefore be delayed. Now, this is an impression, uh, but one pattern that I, have, I observed across the world, and it certainly applies to Latin America, is that countries that have performed the worst have, they're very diverse across the globe, but one common characteristic, and it's not the only one, but one that really is striking is the fact that they all have populist regimes. Uh, and it goes all the way from Russia to Turkey to Italy. Um, Great Britain is not strictly a populist regime, but there are some elements in the discourse and, and mindset of the prime minister who himself became a victim of the, of, 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 of the, of the virus. Of course, the United States, and in Latin America, Mexico, Nicaragua, Brazil, who are the worst performers in terms of the uh, ability to control the pandemic. And that is because populist leaders have a, a number of characteristics in common. One of them is the dismissal of expert opinion. Uh, the populist leader typically considers that he or uh, he, and these are all he is, by the way, uh, because the other interesting observation is that there is an overrepresentation of female political leaders among the countries that have done the best. One of the positive side effects of this pandemic is it would put to rest forever the idea that women are not good political leaders, but whether it's New Zealand or Norway or Taiwan, it's a very interesting cluster of, of women on the best performers. On the worst performers, you have mostly men who are also populists. And um, populists, as I was saying, have this a, a idea that through their contact with the good people, um, they, they have a, a different and superior kind of knowledge. So they tend to uh, really look down the value expert opinion. Um, and, and the other characteristics is that typically they do not like science because science implies independent and critical thinking and because populism usually has some major authoritarian uh, components, uh, that kind of independent and critical thinking is not, uh, is not valid. The net result is that you had across all of these countries the spectacle of political figures contradicting in public contradicting expert opinion and minimizing, delaying, engaging sometimes in magical thought about the fact that the pandemic would disappear uh, spontaneously. And because of the exponential nature of the growth, given how contagious this particular virus is, uh, any delay becomes disastrous. And in many of these countries, you saw two, three week delay and again, by the time the reality imposed itself, there was this entrenched community transmission and there was no other alternative than to engage in these major uh, lockdowns. So uh, it, it is clear that the timing of those mitigation efforts has really, it really shapes the trajectory and the severity of the national outbreaks. Um, and then, of course, the big concern was that you need a health system, all of, every country has a health system, you need a health system to respond. Once the public health response has been overwhelmed and you enter into mitigation strategies, 
You need to worry about the other component of the health system, which is the clinics and hospitals, which are then going to have to take care of those patients. And every one of the projections, and this is where mathematics played a huge role, mathematical modeling, um, what, uh, allowed us to foresee that, or to, to uh, anticipate, predict, that health systems would be overwhelmed. And that's what also prompted the, the massive lockdown measures. And indeed, as Steve was saying, one of these iconic figures of this pandemic is gonna be the concept of the flattening of the curve, uh, which again became a visual uh, element derived from mathematical models that showed that with severe mitigation figures, we would flatten the curve and prevent health systems from being overwhelmed. Now that didn't happen everywhere, especially countries that were hit first, um, like Italy or Spain, the health systems were overwhelmed. And here in the United States, it happened in places like New York City. But, but, but the dramatism of those images of health systems being overwhelmed, actually, I think, was a huge uh, motivator for people to actually observe. And, and in Florida, we did, we did very dramatically as we followed the different models in our own uh, uh, reality saw the flattening of, of the curve. Notwithstanding the, that, I mean, and, and that I do think saved lives, uh, although at some point those populist regimes will have to be held accountable for the deaths that, that happened because of the delay in the initial response. Um, so we find ourselves now in this uh, unprecedented um, uh, dual, but it, 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 dual emergency, two emergencies that are completely interlinked. Um, most countries faced with extensive damage to the economy are uh, rushing to, to, uh, to reopen. If that is not done in a careful way, we of course run the risk of uh, reigniting and, and having a second or third or fourth wave of, of, of the pandemic. Let me just finish by, by saying that um, we, I, I derived three big lessons uh, from, from the pandemic and I do think we owe it to the um, millions of victims, both the people that have gotten sick, obviously the people that have died, but also the people that have suffered immensely by losing their jobs uh, and their livelihoods, by being subject to extreme uh, stress and, and isolation and the health consequences that that in itself creates. We owe it to derive lessons. And to me, um, there, there are four big lessons. The first one is that we, uh, we humans need to put an end to the unsustainable way in which we relate to the rest of the planet. These pandemics are not natural occurrences. They are as anthropogenic as climate change. They derive from the unsustainable ways in which we humans invade ecosystems in the name of, uh, of, uh, of growth, urbanization, the way we engage in uh, food uh, practices, the way we, we deal with poultry, uh, with livestock, in inhumane, unsanitary, crowded conditions that facilitate the, the fact that these viruses, these zoonoses, will jump the species barrier, the presence of these so-called wet markets in Asia and in other parts of the world where there's this uh, promiscuity under very crowded conditions of live animals and, and, and human beings. That promiscuity with, with animals is another factor that prompts, uh, that, prompts that. So I, I hope this will be um, a wake up call to the uh, fact that we need to move into a true era of sustainable development. And that includes these forms of engaging with, uh, with the rest of our planet. Second big lesson is that global problems require global challenges can only be addressed with global solutions. And I really uh, am worried about a backlash, a rekindling of nationalistic xenophobic uh, attitudes and this idea that you know, the virus is a foreign and therefore everything foreign needs to be kept out. Um, and that, uh, and the idea that the ultimate solution is to for countries to isolate, become self-sufficient, etc. That is uh, a, an impossibility. We are an interconnected planet. We are interdependent, and even the most powerful nations cannot be isolated from the complex interdependencies that characterize our world. Third lesson is that the ultimate solution 
will be uh, in, in will lie in science. And this is a reminder of the importance of investing in science, investing in in, in the science of surveillance. That uh, one of the frustrations for those in global public health is that after all the attention that every one of these pandemics garners, as soon as the acute phase of the emergency is over, we go back to the way things were before, under investing. The magnitude of the impact of this pandemic, and particularly its financial consequences, I hope will we'll put an end to that. With an infinitesimal proportion of the economic losses that have been experienced, we could fund a sustained permanent effort to build the platforms, the platforms for better tests, for better drug development, and for vaccines, and the surveillance mechanisms so that we can respond earlier and better when the next pandemic comes. And there will be I do hope there will be a next pandemic that it will not be the final pandemic because that would be a very ominous uh, uh, prediction. But I, I do think and believe strongly that there will be other pandemics and we need to do a better job. And finally, this, uh, this uh, 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 the fourth lesson, is this pandemic reminds us of the importance of developing social forms of interaction that, uh, that, that emphasize the mutuality of responsibility that humans have for each other. In the end, after we have been overwhelmed and absent still a solution coming from biomedical research in the form of, a, of a, an effective drug, a better test effective drugs or eventually a vaccine, what has allowed us to mitigate has been the social interaction and the fact that many, many people have experienced and undergone incredible um, sacrifices to be able to contain a, um, a, a spread of the spread of a disease that had come out of control. And it's the idea of continuing to emphasize that mutuality of responsibility that I think uh, will, will again allow us not just to build a new uh, normal, but a better normal when we all come out of this uh, uh, great uh, emergency that we're experiencing. Uh, with that, uh, I'm again delighted, I'm honored to share uh, not the uh, stage, but the screen with uh, such a uh, prominent uh, scholar as uh, Professor Levin, and I will now turn it back to Steve Cantrell. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second co-moderator, Dr. Gabriela Almeida Alvarez, also from Simvastov. She is director of Simvastov Unanad Arapuato. She is also PI of the Laboratory for Molecular Biology and Microbial Ecology in the Department of Genetic Engineering. She is the leader of the Tyler Siena Viva, a group that organizes scientific workshops with the participation of top scientists to inspire young people interested in pursuing scientific careers. She is the current ambassador of Mexico to the American Association for Microbiology, seeking to spread knowledge on current microbiology research. She will introduce Professor Lebin in both English and Spanish. Gabriela, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Cantrell. It's very kind of you to, to invite me to this exciting you know, place you know, with all of these people from different countries. And I congratulate you and all the people behind the organization of this event of the Institute of the Mathematical Sciences of the Americas at the University of Miami. And I'm honored to present you a brilliant and accomplished scientist. This is Dr. Simon Levin, and he is a James McDonnell Distinguished University Professor in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University and the Director of the Center for Biocomplexity in the Princeton Environmental Institute. I have enjoyed so much the assignment of introducing Dr. Simon Levin. I thought I could use this opportunity to download and read his 500 papers and to talk to more than 100 scientists that studied under his direction. As you guess, I'm not done yet. And one of his papers, The Problem of Pattern and Scale in Ecology, the Robert MacArthur Award Lecture, has inspired at least 7,300 researchers, if we count the number of papers that cited only this particular work. But if you decide to go on the same path as Dr. Levin did, this is what you will do. You will read about ecology, evolution, sociology, 
and then integrate it all and create new fields. Explain them mathematically and determine at what scale the different concepts still work. You will also have to go from the microscopic bacteria to forests to planet scale. And you will need a virtual knife to be able to slice the planet in pieces to study it at different scales without ever forgetting that it all is a system. Simon Levin received his BA from John Hopkins University and his PhD in mathematics from the University of Maryland. He was at Cornell University until 1992. And Dr. Levin is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a member of the National Academy of Science and the American Philosophical Society. He received the National Medal of Science in 2014 the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement in 2014, just to mention a few. And this is a very short summary, but it gives you an idea of who Dr. Levin is. As a colleague of mine says, in biocomplexity, it is almost boring because it's so obvious. There is complexity everywhere, in all aspects of life and in all biological systems. And the hard part of science is not finding the complexity but understanding it. And Simon Levin has provided leadership in showing us how to find the generalities in complex biological systems by using mathematical approaches, identifying targets for innovative research, and starting new fields of investigation. Did you notice the plural in new fields of investigation? Well, that's amazing for a scientist. And his research is certainly a scientific legacy. Dr. Lev Levin will present this talk on mathematical modeling of pandemics, social consequences across the Americas. But before he starts, let me make his presentation in Spanish. Hola a todos. Este, comencé por agradecer al Dr. Cantrell y a la organización en la Universidad de Miami de este evento del Instituto de, Matemat de Ciencias Matemáticas para las Américas. Y ahora voy a presentarles al doctor Levin. Tengo la, fui este, nombrada con esta tarea por el doctor Cantrell. Y déjenme decirles que el doctor Levin es profesor distinguido de la Universidad James S. McDonald en Ecología y Biología Evolutiva en la Universidad de Princeton. Y es también director del Centro de Biocomplejidad en el Instituto Ambiental de Princeton. Disfruté mucho la tarea de preparar la presentación del doctor Simon Levin. Pensé que sería una oportunidad de descargar y leer sus 500 artículos científicos y hablar con más de 100 científicos que estudiaron bajo su dirección. ¿Adivinarán que no he terminado con la tarea? Su artículo, uno de ellos nada más, que es sobre problemas y patrones y la escala en ecología, conferencia de premiación Robert MacArthur, ha inspirado al menos a 7,300 investigadores. Esto si contamos solo el número de citas que tiene este trabajo particular. Busquen y lean sus trabajos, será muy enriquecedor. Si decides seguir el mismo camino que el doctor Levin, esto es lo que tendrás que hacer. Leer sobre ecología, evolución, sociología, luego integrar todo y crear nuevos campos. Explicarlos matemáticamente y determinar a qué escala los diferentes conceptos aún funcionan. También tendrás que pasar de las bacterias microscópicas a los bosques y a la escala planetaria. Necesitarás un cuchillo virtual para poder cortar el planeta en pedazos y estudiarlo a diferentes escalas sin nunca olvidar que se trata de un solo sistema. El doctor Simon Levin recibió su grado de Bachelor in Arts en la Universidad John Hopkins y su doctorado en matemáticas de la Universidad de Maryland. Estuvo en la Universidad de Cornell hasta 1992. El doctor Levin es miembro de la Academia Estadounidense de las Artes y las Ciencias, de la Asociación Estadounidense para el Avance de la Ciencia. Es miembro de la Academia Nacional de Ciencias y de la Sociedad Filosófica Estadounidense. Recibió la Medalla Nacional de Ciencia en el 2014 y el premio Tyler para el logro ambiental también en el 2014. 
Esto es un gran resumen, pero les da una idea de quién es este investigador. Y como dice una, un amigo mío y colega, él dice, la complejidad, la biocomplejidad es casi aburrida porque es obvia. Hay complejidad en todas partes, en todos los aspectos de la vida y en todos los sistemas biológicos. La parte difícil de la ciencia no es encontrar la complejidad, sino comprenderla. Y el doctor Levin tuvo el liderazgo para mostrar cómo encontrar las generalidades en sistemas biológicos complejos mediante el uso de enfoques matemáticos. Identificó los temas de investigación innovadores y construyó nuevos campos de investigación. ¿Notaste el plural en nuevos campos de investigación? Es asombroso. Su investigación es ciertamente un legado científico. El doctor Levin presentará su charla sobre modelado matemático de pandemias, consecuencias sociales en todo el continente americano. Muchas gracias. Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank Steve Cantrell for inviting me to be here and especially Dr. Almedo Alvarez for a wonderful uh, and kind introduction. Um, it's difficult to follow President Frank. He did such a superb job and um, made many of the points that I would like to reinforce with a, a brilliant introduction. So <laughs> you see here the old way to deal with epidemics, which we can no longer uh, deal with because of the shortage of supplies. Uh, I also want to thank the multiple um, organizations that have helped fund my work. So wherever we turn, we hear about models and about uh, COVID-19. Um, the US, Britain, but elsewhere, models are playing an essential role. And, it, it, and very few of us know what's actually in the models. What's in the black box? How good are the models? How much should we trust them? What are their limitations? For what are they most effective? Um, so Professor Cantrell asked me to give a little bit of introduction to mathematical models. It'll be very brief. The theory of infectious diseases, in fact, has a very rich history, going back to Ronald Ross and his work on malaria. Um, but despite a century of elegant theory, new diseases are emerging, like the one we're dealing with now, and old ones like tuberculosis um, are re-emerging. Um, one of the great advances of the theory has been to help advise vaccination strategies. Vaccination, of course, has been held out as our our great hope for COVID, we're not going to get through this until we have effective vaccines. And mathematical theory has played a role uh, in advising um, on what fractions of populations need to be uh, vaccinated in order to provide protection. But we're living in an age where false information is being spread. Individuals willingness to get vaccinated and get their children vaccinated is declining. So diseases we thought were conquered like measles are back in places where they were essentially eliminated in the UK, in the US. Um, many new cases of measles, all associated uh, with reduction in vaccine usage. It will be very interesting to see what happens when we do get a vaccine in terms of the numbers of people willing to to um, get vaccinated. A lot of the points that Professor uh, Frank made um, about the distrust of science are, and the rise of populism are gonna play a role here. Coronavirus isn't a one-off, it's not an outlier. As, as he emphasized to it, it's, it's part of our interconnected viral age and we have to be prepared to deal with many more such. We have some old villains. Influenza A reemerges year after year because the surface antigens can be um, modified and replaced in order to escape our immune systems. Um, so despite the fact that it's essentially infection leads to lifetime immunity to a particular strain, new strains arise. And on longer time scales, we have what are called reassortment events, um, something that's much more of a factor in influenza than it's likely to be with coronavirus because the influenza virus is made up of um, essentially eight separate pieces, the genome. Um, and we have these pandemics, such as we saw in 1918 with influenza, and we're seeing now with coronavirus, 
that lead to huge spikes in the mortality rate and especially the mortality rate due to infectious diseases. So what's the classic theory look like? The classical theory breaks the population up into compartments, susceptible, exposed or latent, infectious and removed. And most um, models that one sees of infectious diseases give short shrift to the, um, to the latent phase. But we know that for um, COVID-19, that's a much more important factor. So one writes equations for these, but most important is what happens in the infectious class. Does it continue to increase? And the number that you've all seen talked about is either what's called R0, or here I'll call it R effective, which is a very simple notion. I won't even write down things with symbols. It's the fraction, I'm working from the end, the fraction of the individuals in the population that are susceptible multiplied by how long infected individuals remain infected multiplied by the rate at which they will transmit from infectious to susceptible per unit time. And this tells us how many new cases one infected individual can, um, can lead to. And in particular, if everybody in the population is susceptible, as it is at the beginning of an epidemic for, for, for a new introduction, as it was for COVID-19, then we rename the effective R as R0. And you've all heard about R0 and estimates of what it is, anything ranging from two or so up to much larger numbers. The truth is it varies from place to place depending on uh, the degree to which conditions are crowded, uh, the degree to which people are socially distancing, etc. So what's the goal to control an outbreak? We want to make sure that the number of new cases per infected case is less than one. Then the, then the outbreak will drop down. And there are three ways to do it because there are three terms here. One is working from the end again. We can reduce the fraction that are susceptible for example, through natural infection or for the development of a vaccine. But as we know, that's a long time scale. I'm talking about a year or two, um, a long time scale frame. So we need things to do in the meantime. The second thing we can do is to reduce the infectious period by treating people. You've, you've, you've heard of remdesivir and the fact that it's able to reduce the time that people are sick from um, from perhaps 15 days to 11 days. That doesn't sound perhaps like a lot, but it, it's a huge reduction in, in the transmission. And most importantly, um, the fact that remdesivir works at all gives us some insight into targets that we might um, focus on to improve um, the treatment of infected people uh, in, in a more efficient way. The third thing, and that operates on an intermediate time scale. We've already got some antivirals that are working there and hopefully that will improve. Um, but the most immediate thing we can do, the thing that buys us time is reducing the transmission coefficient. And that's, as you heard from Professor Frank, what many countries have had to resort to doing, what all of them have had to do to some extent through the things that we're all doing, the reason we're online here, social distancing, quarantine, uh, and the use of face masks. Um, this mainly, this operates on a fast time scale, but mainly what it does is not solve the problem, but flatten the curve or bend the curve, as Steve said, and buy us time while we come up with the um, more specific longer term solutions. So this, there are a lot of complications for modeling that arise uh, because of the unique nature of COVID-19. Uh, going back to the original diagram you see at the bottom, uh, as you heard from President Frank, we have to deal with asymptomatic infections. We don't have good estimates of what fraction of the individuals are, are asymptomatic. The numbers are all over the place. Uh, but we do know that there are a lot of undocumented infections that are the result of these asymptomatic cases. Secondly, there's tremendous age specificity. There always is, but more so with COVID-19 than we're used to. Um, in terms of the degree of lethality for older individuals and the fact that younger individuals, for the most part, do much better. Um, but also that may mean there are many more 
undocumented cases, many more asymptomatic cases among the young. Uh, and if we send children back to school and they come home, uh, they may be bringing the virus and infecting their older parents. Um, there's a lot of spatial heterogeneity. Frank emphasized this by talking about the way different countries um, have dealt with the disease. But one of the aspects of spatial her heterogeneity that's important is the asynchrony, namely that outbreaks occur in one place long after they've occurred in another place. And that makes it much more difficult to control. We have experience with this, um, with measles, this is the work of my colleague, Brian Grenfell and colleagues in which outbreaks occur in one city, get damped down, but meanwhile have seeded outbreaks in other cities. That makes control much more difficult. Uh, and that's what we're gonna find going forward. And another complication is understanding what the effects are of interventions. A lot of the modeling efforts have been directed at trying to understand that. And the main goal of this, in addition to buying us time, is trying to keep the peak number of cases down below where it overwhelms our healthcare systems. So how does that lead to a, the modification of the basic framework. This is actually not a model developed for COVID-19, but it's basically the, the structure of what most models that we are seeing uh, for COVID-19, all of the models coming out of Harvard, of Imperial College, of Oxford, of University of Washington, Texas, Virginia, et cetera, have this basic structure that is the including not only of a preclinical stage, but of, of the bifurcation of the population into asymptomatic and symptomatic um, cases. Almost all of the models uh, are slight variants on this structure, but adding in um, things like age structure and um, perhaps spatial heterogeneity and then control measures uh, all into the framework. There are a number of uncertainties that need to be emphasized that make the modeling difficult. The mechanistic modeling is limited by the fact that we don't know what percent of the infections are asymptomatic. Uh, the numbers may be as low as 20%. Some estimates have put them up as high as 90% or even higher. Until we can get a handle on that, which is going to require, which is possible to, to address, but it's going to require um, intensive testing, um, the models are going to be vastly variable in terms of their predictions. Uh, we also don't know how infectious the asymptomatics are. Uh, we don't know whether the asymptomatics are acquiring immunity or whether they're, for example, dealing with the infection uh, by killer T cells instead of um, um, antigen-specific antibodies that will provide long-term immunity. We don't know much about viral evolution. We know there's some variation. Um, and will viral evolution mean if we come up with a vaccine this year, we'll need a new vaccine next year or the year after like we do for flu? Um, we don't know how many people are gonna be willing to get vaccinated. Um, and we don't know much about the economic trade-offs yet. Um, so the, the last question I'd like to touch on, which I know is in everybody's mind is, how do we restart the economy Obviously, we can't keep it shut down forever. Um, social distancing was essential. Had we not done it, we'd be much worse off. Had we done it earlier, we'd be much better off. Exact timing, however, is not possible. And therefore, one has to take uncertainty into account because uh, and, and take strategies uh, which maintain the social distancing for long, over longer periods of time than we would if we knew exactly when things uh, were going to peak. Um, this article appeared a few weeks ago, uh, actually just last week in the, in the New York Times, um, coming out of Jeffrey Shaman's group really, that um, because, as, as, as President Frank said, because of the delays in the lockdown, uh, this cost at least 36,000 lives is the estimate. So earlier control would be much better. The US is about three times the size of Japan. It's had about 100 times as many cases. That just doesn't compute and tells you something about how important the way we respond uh, to this outbreak 
um, has been and will be. Uh, the original Brit British model, which was similar to the Swedish model, which would have just let natural um, immunity arise, herd immunity, by letting people get sick, would have been a disaster. The Swedish model has not worked well. They have not developed high levels of herd immunity. It's still under 10%. 10 percent um, and uh, huge numbers of deaths compared to the other Scandinavian countries. So going forward, um, as we relax our controls, we can't just um, allow willy-nilly relaxation, just opening up beaches, opening up churches, opening up other places where there'll be lots of people in close contact with each other. Uh, we will eventually return to something closer to normalcy, but it's going to re but it's going to require, and these are just reinforcing the points President Frank made, um, doing so wisely, testing and contact tracing are going to be key. That can't be emphasized uh, strongly enough. That is going to be the key uh, to to wise uh, relaxation and reopening of the economy and global coordination is going to be essential. So those are all of my introductory remarks and uh, I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Professor Levin and Professor Omedo Alvarez. It is now time for our question and answer session. Professors Lupercio and Omedo Alvarez will alternate asking questions in English. We have received a number of insightful questions some will be directed specifically to President Frank and others to Professor Levin, while some are appropriate for either or both. Remember that you may submit questions as our session progresses. If you do, please submit in English. We will try to address as many as possible. And I will shift the first question to uh, Professor Lupercio to ask in just a second and we will be going. Here we have a question that, I, uh, that is directed to both Julio and Simon. Um, how do you recommend modelers interact with policymakers when there is a dismissal of math models? Professor Frank? Let me, let me start and of course I Look forward to what the the actual person who understands models here, who is Professor Levine, can 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 address. And thank you, Professor Levine. Your presentation was just outstanding and, and incredibly clear and, and insightful. Um, you know, th this is a, a a more general issue. You you do. I, I think we had made huge progress on the notion of evidence-based policy making. Um, now that, and, and we've seen a reversal, uh, quite honestly. Uh, one of the positive aspects of this pandemic is, as I was saying before, even in the presence of populist governments that tend to dismiss uh, expertise and science in general, you see this um, demand from the public, from the media, because in the face of uncertainty, you need to have some guidance into the future. Otherwise, it is incredibly anxiety producing and it might be, even lead to panic responses. So modelers have been playing an, a, a very important role. Now, I, I appreciate there's, uh, as the question says, there's even debate among scientists whether the models are, are right, whether even modeling is at all possible. I think we've, we've, um, we've seen uh, uh, the utility of those models. I, I do think we can credit the, uh, the fact that in many places, in most places actually, health systems were not overwhelmed. I'm talking here of the, of the United States because of the effect of the modeling on decisions that were made by policymakers. Now, how do you do that? It, it cannot be left to chance. I think you need to create uh, structures for that interaction to happen. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a broader question, as I was saying before. To begin with, you do need to, to um, have this public demand for, for some element of rationality in, among policymakers. 
The second thing is you need to have accountable governments um, that if they choose to ignore science or you choose to do, for example, what's been sadly happening in Mexico, where a lot of the expert voices in what's, what had otherwise been a superb epidemiological surveillance system that served us very well, for example, in 2009, H1N1 um, swine flu uh, pandemic, which where the index cases were identified in Mexico, that superb system has been obscuring some of the data so that it conforms to the political discourse. I think that is something that societies need to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, there needs to be also international concern and pressure so that countries report in a transparent and timely manner. Otherwise, the data that's being used for decision making is flawed. And this is part of that fourth lesson, which is the idea that social concept of neutrality or responsibility. We are responsible for each other. And countries need to understand, uh, you know, this, this time around, need to understand the global implications of delays in notifying outbreaks. I know there's huge financial consequences and countries, governments, not countries, governments face these incentives to report. But there's got to be uh, a, 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 a global pressure for epidemiological transparency. And governments need to be held to account if they delay reporting, because it puts everybody else at risk. So it's both a, a, a global pressure. Um, the great institution we have to do that is the World Health Organization. We need to strengthen the World Health Organization so that it can play that role more effectively, not weaken it. And it has to happen within countries, mostly to, to um, uh, making sure that experts are embedded through task force and other mechanisms in the policy making process. Um, and, and, and that becomes then the counterbalancing force to uh, maybe some tendencies by politicians to not be enti entirely transparent and, and, or, or, and which leads to the, the sort of delays that we have seen in this case. Um, yes, I, I'd like to reinforce those points, but also I'd like to embed this um, excellent question in the broader context of um, an appreciation of science and scientific uh, advice in general for a variety of problems we face. It's not just in, in the case of infectious diseases, but climate change, biodiversity loss, et cetera, many of the things President Frank was talking about at the beginning. Um, there's been a breakdown in communication between policymakers and, uh, uh, and scientists. Um, and um, if I had a, to vote for person of the year this year, uh, it would be for Anthony Fauci, uh, who has played a critical role as someone who is willing to take positions that um, he knows will not be popular with everyone, but is able to, to, to um, understand what models can do, to talk with modelers, and then to turn around and talk with policymakers and politicians. Most modelers are not in a position to be able to deal directly um, with decision makers. They need people like um, Dr. Fauci and President Frank, who on the one hand understand the science and understand what modeling can do, and on the other hand understand the needs of policymakers. It's probably not just um, three levels uh, from the policymaker to the interpreter to those doing the modeling. We may need other steps along the way, but we've got to rebuild that trust. Uh, and uh, we see the same thing in, in dealing with climate change. Um, there's got to be a, um, a, a pathway from, from what the modelers are doing back up to the policymakers and back down to the modelers to understand what, um, um, what critical information they can provide. I, I think the other thing that modelers have to be careful to do, and I, I, I'm not so convinced that there's been time maybe to do that with, with the models of um, COVID-19, is to make, on the one hand, make clear the level of uncertainty in models, but on the other hand, make clear what models can, can do. 
um, presenting one answer, if you, when I open up the paper and see that a particular model uh, predicts that on June 17th, that there will be 123,411 um, deaths um, accumulated in, in the US, I, I don't trust that number. If it said there'll be somewhere between uh, 110,000 and 130,000, I'd have much more confidence in it. We need to be able to communicate our levels of uncertainty. There's a tendency not to do that because whenever one communicates uncertainty in the models, it gives people an excuse to say, well, they don't really know what's going to happen. We have to convey the range of outcomes and uh, present the information honestly, and we have to rely on honest interpreters uh, like uh, Tony Fauci and Julio Frank. Okay, we move to the next question for Dr. Levin, and it says, in your expert opinion, which is the best of the widely used models for COVID-19? And among the models you know, how are these models keeping track of all predictions and comparing them to new predictions? And which is the best fit model to predict infection in health facility workers? Well, I think all of the, um, of the prominent models, and then I'll mention what they are, um, are doing the best they can to, um, um, to keep track of um, daily changes in information and, and, um, and to update the models. And when you see major recalculations coming out of the models, it's because new information has come in. That new information may be about something like um, policy changes in terms of social distancing and things of that sort. Um, if, if one sees that uh, state X is going to relax um, its social distancing, then that's for sure going to lead to, an, to a, a re revised estimate upwards in the number of cases and the number of, uh, of fatalities. Uh, but secondly, um, thanks to um, contact tracing, to mobile phone data that will be uh, forthcoming, um, et cetera, uh, we're getting better estimates of the fractions of individuals that are um, asymptomatic and, and other factors of that sort. A colleague of mine, Richard Levins, once wrote a paper which said the truth is the intersection of independent lies. And I'm afraid that's much the case that we're dealing with here with infectious disease models. I wish those models were not out there competing with each other, but we could do what's been done with climate models is that the leading modelers could get together and present the range, the range of possible outcomes. I don't believe that any of, so the, for me, the, the, the leading models are the ones that come out of the groups um, that I have the most trust in. This would include, however, a range of estimates coming out of Harvard University, coming out of Columbia, coming out of Cambridge, um, I'm sorry, Imperial College, coming out of Oxford, coming out of the University of Washington, University of Texas, and the University of Virginia. Um, all of them are developing models, all some variants on the model structure I showed you before, all making different assumptions uh, about percent asymptotic, uh, it, uh, I'm sorry, a percent uh, asymptomatic, um, et cetera. Um, and on well, none of them would I um, place a, a huge bet, but collectively, uh, I look at all of them and they give me um, some um, good estimates of the range of possible outcomes. So I, I don't think this is an area where one can pick a winner. I think the models have, have in useful ways informed the decision-making process. I think they're gonna get better. I think as data gets better, data and uncertainty about the data are the major limitations of all of the models. The next question reads, uh, what factors should we consider to develop an epidemiological model that can be representative for a specific country? That question is again for you, Dr. Levin. Yeah, well, this, this follows up on, on what I was um, uh, just saying. Um, all, all, all of the models have the same similar structure, but obviously the parameters vary 
from place to place. And the only way you can develop a model that's going to be effective uh, for a particular city or a particular country is to have better information about the uncertainties, which as far as I'm concerned are almost entirely uh, in, in terms of the data, the, the things I've already mentioned. Um, there, some of the uncertainties, like um, whether the virus is going to evolve, I, I think are not near-term uh, considerations. They're considerations for thinking about things a year or two down the line. But in the short run, it's um, the issue of, of what fraction are asymptomatic, uh, how infectious are asymptomatic individuals, are individuals who are recovering developing immunity? We, we really don't even know that yet. How age specific is the information? Secondly, um, are, are the things that relate to transmission, uh, and that's extremely difficult to estimate. The reason the numbers are, are so high in places, or have been places like New York, is because of the high density, because it's impossible to as effectively social distance as I can um, here, I haven't been within 10 feet of anyone except my wife uh, in nearly three months. If I lived in New York, the only way I could do that would be, and I, I know people in this category, to be locked up in my apartment. So getting estimates of um, contact rates, probabilities of transmission, um, and um, it is going to be essential. So that applies to wherever one's trying to develop an estimate. Uh, is to is 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 to in a pro projection um, is to get clarification on the crucial parameters, including um, the parameters that are related to management strategies like social distancing and the willingness of individuals to wear masks, socially distance, uh, etc. Thank you, Dr. Levin. So I have this question now for Dr. Frank and Dr. Levin. And the question is, is Mexico estimating correctly number of cases and deceased? Is there a way to assess more realistic figures of the pandemic in Mexico in spite of too little testing? Well, let me take a um, crack at it since I published yesterday an op-ed <laughs> in one of the leading newspapers in Mexico, uh, basically saying what, what every expert is saying, no, Mexico is, is not estimating correctly the number of cases or the number of deaths. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is, you know, the, the, the convergence of every one of the models that Professor Levine is mentioning is that the, the numbers are, are severely underestimated. Um, but furthermore, for deaths, there is a, a, an, an alternative method, this is not modeling, this is just an, an alternative method of counting deaths, which is what's called excess mortality. And basically it means, you, because you know, mortality rates, especially if you take three year averages, tend to be very stable across time. Uh, if you take mortality da uh, data by, by month, and when you see huge peaks, it's because something anomalous is happening. But absent any anomaly, they tend to be remarkably st stable. And those anomalies are typically epidemics or outbreaks or you know, major attack of some sort. Um, so there's been now two, uh, actually three separate um, exercises for Mexico City, which presumably has the best data in the country, um, where researchers went and computed and counted death certificates. Uh, so again, this is not modeling, this is looking at an alternative source of information created the rolling averages. And if you do that, uh, one of the estimates is that Mexico City, the reported number of deaths uh, has, is, is, is only about 25% of the total number of deaths of that, of that excess mortality. So if you take the excess in this period of time from basically March through May, we're probably underestimating, uh, and we, we would have to multiply by four the official figure is less than 2,000. It's probably closer to 8,000. And that's a very, very severe underestimate. And that is not depending on testing uh, the, the number, it's the number of tests. Now, why is that happening? Why do we have that under registration? A big part is because 
the number of tests is ridiculously low. It's the lowest, obviously in the OECD countries, Mexico is one of those countries, but it is the lowest among Latin American countries. And when you see the divergence between Mexico and Brazil on the one hand, which are the worst performers, and the rest, the big, a big difference is the number of tests. So the answer to the question is it is not, a, a, I, I don't think it's a, a question now, that there's a huge underestimation. And um, the, Mexico also has a, a system of um, so-called sentinel sites, which is a valid system for surveillance. Just obviously this is not good for contact tracing or, or case detection, but for surveillance. Uh, and the government has been using multipliers, which again, some mathematicians have questioned that. The multiplier that's used is eight times based on, on the sampling methodology. Uh, most mathematicians agree that that in itself is an undercount. So even estimates derived from outside modeling, uh, like the like sampling methodologies or, or this method of uh, excess mortality, everything points to the fact that there's an estimate. And, and the title of my op-ed yesterday was uh, Navigating Blind. I mean, you basically, the eyes of the surveillance system are the tests. If you do not do tests, you are blind, as in, not just to navigate the, the pandemic, but also to reopen the economy. Because as, as Professor Levin said, the a critical factor to reopen safely and not risk a, ne a second uh, wave of the epidemic is to be able to conduct extensive testing. Thank you. Uh, I, Dr. Levin? Yeah, I, I want to reinforce uh, that point and, and also to point out, um, as Dr. Frank knows better than I do, that there are multiple kinds of testing. There's testing that, uh, that will tell us whether someone's got an active infection, and then there are serological tests that will tell us if they developed antibodies. Um, and um, and um, both are going to be essential in the long run. I have no doubt that um, the number of cases in Mexico has been underestimated. Uh, I have no doubt the number of cases in the U.S. is generally uh, underestimated because we're getting biased samples if we only deal with people who uh, think they've been exposed or people who are not feeling well and come in for tests. Um, we're only seeing a, a part of the picture. So uh, many places are gearing up now, including uh, here in Princeton, to do widespread testing to, to be able to estimate the number of, uh, uh, of cases that are that are active and we're ultimately, we need to know how many people are, are developing antibodies and we need to know how protective those uh, uh, antibodies are. The, the, the whole dispute between uh, Imperial College and Oxford uh, was because again, uh, of, of the uncertainty of how many cases there were, how many asymptomatic individuals there might've been. I, I was involved in one study uh, led by my former student, Ailey Klein at Johns Hopkins University uh, looking at New York and other data and saying we one couldn't have had um, such a rapid bomb-like um, outbreak unless either R0 was extremely high or there were a large number of asymptomatic individuals, but we didn't know which. Uh, and until we do the testing, we're just not going to know. Uh, and I'm sure we're underestimating the number of cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Levine. Uh, the next question is uh, for both of you, and uh, it's as follows. Is it possible to time predict, or at least estimate, the second wave, both in the U.S. and or in Mexico? Well, I'll defer to Professor Levin and, <laughs> and okay, keep well, you hear what he has to say. Um, there, there's one other uncertainty um, that I didn't mention that, that I should have mentioned um, where, where um, I'm afraid the, uh, the initial information is somewhat discouraging, which is we just don't know what's going to happen during the summer. Uh, we, we don't know how, how the changing temperature and, and, and humidity is going to affect the virus. Um, traditional wisdom based on influenza is that it's seasonal. Uh, in part because of weather conditions, in part because children are back in school and therefore in close contact. Um, unfortunately, as we look to Brazil, which is seeing outbreaks of cases 
uh, the high temperatures there don't seem to be helping much. But let's assume that the, the virus, that we get things under some degree of control. Um, I, I think a, a second wave is extremely likely uh, in the fall, um, largely because of relaxation of the preventative measures we're doing now. Schools are reopening. Um, it varies, but um, we're, we're certainly going to see lots of places where standards are relaxed, and therefore, uh, I think that we will um, uh, see a second wave. The, what we have to hope is that we are more prepared for that second wave. We don't allow it. To, it's not essential that it gets uh, out of control to the same extent. It's not essential that it, uh, that it overwhelm our healthcare system. Um, we have to take it, just take it more seriously the next time around. And therefore, to answer your question, it's extremely difficult to predict because, because the uncertainties there are largely uh, sociological and political as to what measures we will take uh, to restrain it. I, I'm, my expectation is some places uh, will do very well and other places will see very serious outbreaks. I hope I'm wrong about the latter. Yeah, I, I, let me add one thing. I, I completely agree with, with that perspective. Um, in the face of uncertainty, you know, we're talking about policymakers. And by the way, I appreciate very much the comment from Professor Levin. There is this key role of translation serving as interpreters. I have been on both sides of that dialogue, sometimes from academia, sometimes from policymaking. And, and I have come to appreciate the role that, that um, uh, translators uh, or interpreters, as he as he called it, uh, called us, because I, I do think I fall in that category. <clears throat> we 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 need to keep that dialogue. We need to actually train more of those people because most of us have come through that through accidents of our own biographies, but not not in a systematic way. And I do think, by the way, it's a core function of universities to actively engage in that kind of policy translation. But leaving that aside, one of the things we do in that translation faced with uncertainty is create contingency plans. You develop scenarios based on the best available. You develop alternative models, taking into account that there is uncertainty, and you then plan for different scenarios. And, and that's exactly what, what the countries that have done best actually have had alternative plans. They haven't just been reacting. They've been trying to anticipate and be ready for different scenarios because of the uncertainty. And, and that's what we need to do as we go into the, the, the summer and the fall. And I do agree, the main determinant is going to be how thoughtfully and, and uh, local governments, this is going to be highly regionalized, uh, reopen the economy. And those that do it in a methodic, careful, thoughtful way, I think will do much better than those that just uh, go willy-nilly, as Professor Levine called it. <clears throat> Thank you. So we have. A last question, this is for Dr. Frank, and it says, beyond having a fund for epidemic events, how should healthcare policies be modified going forward as a result of COVID-19? Well, it's, it's got to be, you know, what our, the, the big lessons I was, I was talking about. We, we, we need to bring evidence, scientifically derived evidence, to the core of the policy making process. And, uh, that, that's a, a, a first issue. We, we were in this wave of, of science skepticism, uh, which populist leaders have taken to a, a, a level that I haven't seen in my professional career before. But it also permeates behaviors. Vaccine hesitancy is one very tragic expression of that. Climate change denial is another one. The, the one bright fact side here is I do see the public clamoring for more of that role and, and figures like Anthony Fauci, like Professor Levine said, have become, you know, maybe unpopular among certain very conservative political groups, but he's become incredibly uh, credible. They've been the voice of credibility. This is a good moment for us who, who, who are in the business of producing knowledge through rigorous methods. To, to take advantage of this and pursue this action of translation in a more vigorous way, engage with policymakers, 
and and uh, and with the public at large, and and make sure that we fulfill that that a part of our core mission as universities, which is to not just produce the knowledge but translate it into technologies and into evidence that guides decision making at all levels, at the household level, at the practitioner level, and at the policy maker level. I think that those could be some of the bright elements that come out of this um, um, you know, catastrophe that we've been involved in. in with the coronavirus. Okay, thank you, thank you. So Steve, do we have more questions here? No, that's the last question. Let me make just a few remarks. Uh, again, my deepest thanks to President Frank and Professor Levin for a stimulating and exciting morning and to Professors Lupercio and Omeda Alvarez for your service this morning. If you want to bring today's event to the attention of friends or colleagues, it will be posted for viewing in the IMSA YouTube web link on our website. I hope that today's event has been valuable and will serve to stimulate further cooperation and collaboration across the mathematical and biological communities across the America at this very crucial time. Exciting work is going on here at UM and among our partners. We are all in this together and together we are indeed better. I wish all of you health and safety and fulfillment going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you.